Um, so I think, uh, like, like Jeremy, I was very happy to find about the programming conference. Um, and the reason for me was that this was probably the only place that would accept a paper like this. <laughs> um, so um, I think there's, there's a little bit of um, mismatch between the talk and the paper, because if you, if you read the paper, it's written in this uh, dialogue style where um, you, have, you have different characters arguing. So there's a, this is a sample, sample page where Tao is, is telling everyone in the classroom how we must prove all our programs correct, and that's the only thing we should be doing. Um, and then there's, there's other characters, and I can't quite... I was re briefly thinking about getting four different or five different people on stage arguing, but then I thought, well, uh, maybe that would be a bit too brave. So, um, the paper is, is structured around errors um, and understanding errors in programming. And the first remark about errors in programming is from Charles Babbage, who says, if trials of three or four simple cases have been made and are found to agree with the results given by the engine, it's scarcely possible that there can be any error. So, Babbage thought, this is fine, just try your, your analytical engine with two cases, and if it works, it works. Um, I think when I started programming, I learned that this wasn't the case in the first five minutes. Um, in the industry, it actually took a lot longer than five minutes. Um, so, in the 40s, the, the ENIAC programmers had this vision that there will be the programmer who will produce a plan. And then the ENIAC woman would simply set up the machine to perform these plans. <laughs> and that this uh, turns out to be difficult um, and require radically innovative thinking was totally unanticipated. So people really thought, we'll just have the programmer produce a plan. And uh, I didn't spend too much time looking into how you program ENIAC but it looks like a nightmare. So, um, if, there's, if there's anyone here who has encountered ENIAC, please explain to me how you can program this thing. But um, it's, a, it's a really interesting sort of development that uh, still people sort of, it took them a long time to realize that, that encoding the ideas into the actual machine is really hard. Um, and I think it sort of, slowly turned into the exact opposite. Um, so this is a nice book that traces some of the history of programming, and uh, a quote from the book says that by the end of 60s, many were talking of a crisis, and uh, managers, academics, and governments would release warnings about the desperate state of the, of the software industry with ritualistic regularity. Um, and we are still, we are still in that in that stage. I think uh, we've survived 2000s, but uh, there's every now and then you will read how computers will utterly destroy the entire world because of errors. So we've had, we've been, we've been living, we've been living with errors for uh, more than 50 years, and I think what I find interesting is that different people in the programming community or different within different paradigms, found different ways of dealing with errors. Um, and I started think, started sort of looking at the different different kinds of approaches that we uh, that different people employ to deal with errors. So I'll go briefly through some of them. Uh, and I think the first one is the sort of um, practitioner's approach where you know you're going to make errors um, and you try to eliminate that in some ways um, and uh, in my sort of reconstruction of the history I think this, this goes back to the data processing industry and COBOL where um, part of the motivation was actually to eliminate the need for skilled programmers so you wanted to hire, hire people who weren't especially skilled, uh, have, you wanted to have some skilled, some skilled people who would sort of organize the process um, and 
uh, a lot of the a lot of the thinking in these days came from the sort of managerial perspective where we want to build software so that the, the workers uh, who do it are replaceable uh, mostly uh, and um, I think one of the sort of early early um, important events in the in the in this direction is the NATO conference on software engineering in 1668 where uh, the sort of summary of the conference is that the black art of programming has to make way for the science of software engineering um, and this is really this is really a part of the idea that in engineering you can replace some of your workers and you'll still be fine and um, in programming this didn't quite work because um, somehow it, there was no it wasn't it wasn't a well structured process so a lot of the sort of dealing with errors in this in this frame in this context um, involves trying to have a better company process that's more reproducible uh, where if an error happens we have a way of addressing it um, and I think there's a, there's a very different very interesting sort of trace in the history where uh, the, the community who approaches these errors in this way sort of started with the, with the transition from the black art into the software engineering in 1968 and very recently uh, the software craftsmanship movement sort of goes in the opposite direction where uh, it realizes that maybe doing all these, all these processes didn't quite didn't quite work or uh, maybe it's just sort of another development of the of the thinking and the, the software craftsmanship movement is more is sort of giving the, the value and the power back to the individuals and the interactions over the processes. Um, and I think one sort of more technical end result of this of this trend are things like test-driven development um, and test-driven development is really interesting if you, if you try to think what how they are using programming errors uh, because what you do in test-driven development in a sense is that you create an error or introduce an error by adding a failing test so you're explicitly finding the errors and then you eliminate the error by correcting your implementation um, so in, in other words, the error here uh, gets used as a medium for information and uh, when people think of tests as specifications, it really is uh, using the errors to build up the specification. So you're using errors to describe what the program actually is. Um, and because of the sort of technical link, uh, they are actually part of the, the program they run, so it ends up being something more than a documentation you have on the side on paper. Uh, so this is the this is one perspective on errors, uh, and uh, as you can see on the top, I had crafted this Lego figure. So uh, another really important or a really interesting trend uh, is treating errors in the sort of strict theoretical sense uh, which I think goes back to the to the Algol programming language or the Algol design and uh, I'm, I'm young enough that I haven't written any Algol or I've done Pascal that I was starting but uh, Algol has this uh, has this, uh, it's sort of highly appreciated in certain circles as a remarkable computer science achievement. Um, and when you read what people write about alcohol, they'll say it's an object of beauty, although it has never really been widely used. Um, so what is, what is this, what is this uh, thing about alcohol that makes it be highly appreciated uh, yet there's plenty more cobble and forthright code out there. Um, 
And I think the, the really interesting thing about Algol is that it sort of defined this academic programming language agenda that's at the, at the heart of the trends to use formal methods in programming. Um, so this is a, a quote from a really nice book, uh, Science of Operations, by Mark Priestley, which traces some of the history of programming. And what he was he's saying is that he's describing this Algol research program, which started around 60s, um, of using formal methods in programming. And the goal of the, of the program was to utilize the resources of logic to increase the confidence in the correctness of program. And um, I think this is a quote, this is quoting Dijkstra that instead of debugging a program, you should prove that it's correct. Um, and you can, you can definitely see this, see this tradition, uh, maybe not so much at, uh, at this conference, but uh, to, to paraphrase, paraphrase what Gilad Braha was saying yesterday, uh, this is the one conference and then the other 50 conferences fit in this, fit in this world. Um, and the Algol research program, uh, 50 years later, we are still working on it. Um, if you read something from um, the dependently typed programming languages community, they will say very similar things what, uh, what the authors of Algol were saying. Well, it's more work. Um, today, people will still think that maybe formally verifying everything is, is quite hard. But we will convince you that uh, now we have all the right tools and we are finally close. Um, in the next 50 years, we will be there. Uh, so um, I think what's really interesting about this is that it, um, historically, it's been a very good strategy for programming languages um, as an academic community because uh, the academic world generally highly regards the, the ideals that the ALGO program stands for. Um, and um, so it definitely had very, very positive influence in one way. Uh, but on the other hand, what uh, I find really interesting is that it sort of influences what questions we can ask. So uh, the idea of research paradigms from Kuhn is that you have uh, this sort of encompassing framework that defines um, what are the methods for doing science, what are the questions that we can ask, how we answer them, and this is partly limiting what we can think outside. Um, and I think that's definitely one thing that treating errors as contradiction and trying to eliminate them through logic and formalism, uh, what, what it leads to. So this is, this is errors. Now the interesting thing um, is that uh, people from that community or some of the most famous proponents of this idea, like Sir Tony Horn, uh, this, is a, this is a very nice paper you can read, who's, who's saying or writing a paper on how did software get so reliable without proofs. So we've been telling you for 50 years that you can't write correct software if you don't have, don't use the, the resources of logic and don't use the, the formal methods to prove them correct and yet um, people somehow manage to write a lot of software that mostly works. So how is this possible? Um, and what he's saying in the paper is, is mostly saying, well, it turns out that often the, the solid engineering practices work well enough. Um, I think the paper isn't um, is still very well within the, the tradition, but it's sort of looking outside at, at other, other approaches to errors. Um, so I talked about two methods already. I talked about the sort of software engineering methodology, and I talked about the formal, um, formal uh, <coughs> approaches. And uh, I have two more for you. One is um, coming from the Erlang world or Erlang community or distributed systems community. 
And I think this will, there's definitely more work in that, in that area. I just picked this one because I'm more familiar with it. So in Erlang, uh, the, the world where people live is this distributed, long-running systems world where you have um, the entire, entire phone network running an Erlang program, and um, errors will often happen just because of the scale. Um, and if you're if you're if you build a data center that's uh, several kilometers, several squared kilometers in size, the, even the cosmic ray can occasionally flip a bit just because of the scale. Um, so I think Erlang is, is one of the um, languages that come from this tradition where we say, well, errors will just ha eventually happen at runtime, no matter how good we are, how careful we are and no matter how much formalism we use. Um, and what the, what the Erlang community is saying, well, uh, what, what do you do? What kind of code must the programmer write when they find an error? Uh, and the idea is, let some other process fix the error, uh, and for the current process, it means let it crash. So the idea of handling errors is that we'll write the software in a in a way where if an error happens, the software should sort of detect the error and kill itself and let someone else deal with the problem. Um, so it's a, way of, it's, a, it's a way of living in the world where we admit, yes, errors will happen at runtime and uh, we'll have to come up with ways of, um, of dealing with those errors and writing <coughs> software so that an error doesn't immediately destroy the whole world. So error doesn't mean contradiction and all your program uh, is false and you can't continue. It means something that we can live with and recover from. And we had a really nice talk at uh, the Salon de Refuse workshop about anti-fragile software, which is one of the um, ideas for taking this even further and creating software where the more errors it encounters, the more it learns from the software, from the errors, and the more, the, the better it will run in the future. Um, so, the, the one interesting thing you can, you can find out when you read these, these papers on Erlang, or read the articles on Erlang, is that they partly see errors as, a, as the lack of specification. So, this is a uh, sort of the exact opposite to what the test-driven community was saying. And here, in Erlang, the idea is if you, if you encounter a situation in your program where you don't know what code to write because this uh, is strange or you haven't even figured out how to handle the case yet, it is fine just to let the program crash um, and let someone else deal with it. And I think the other, the other interesting question here is, um, or it's sort of exposing this question, is it still an error when we expect it to happen? Um, and I think if you, if you put in a, in a single room the formal theoretician and an airline person, then they will have really hard time understanding each other, because if I expect this to happen, it's not formally an error, but um, in airline, they really see it as an error. So I'm sort of escaping, escaping this uh, simple world where we know what an error is. Um, and I think it's, it's actually a really interesting question to sort of um, see what all these different approaches tell us about what is actually an error. Um, and there's some thoughts on this in the, in the essay, uh, but I'm not going to replicate everything in the talk. You'll have to read it. Um, and instead, I'm going to go to the last character of the, of the game. Um, and uh, this, is, this is partly inspired by my friend in Cambridge, Sam Aaron, who's a live, live coder or live music programmer, um, who goes around clubs and uses, uh, uses Sonic Pi to play music. Um, and, um, I'll return to the music theme in a, in a second uh, because that's sort of the, the current 
incarnation of, what, or one of the current incarnations of, of the idea. Um, and going, going back in time, um, I think this, you, can, you can trace the similar sort of thinking through the small talk community. Um, and I'm not really uh, as, as well as, a, as an expert in small talk as many people in the room. So I'm going to refer to Mark Priestley's book again, where he's contrasting the alcohol approach and the, the small talk way of thinking uh, by saying small talk approach to design of languages is quite different than what the alcohol was doing. And in small talk, programming was not thought of as the task of constructing a linguistic entity, but rather as a process of working interactively with the semantic representation of the program. So, um, and I think Gilad, Gilad Bracha's keynote was a really nice example of this, where in the live coded world, you really interact with the, with the entities, sort of interact with them live, um, rather than, rather than uh, constructing this dead, dead code uh, printed on that piece of tree that you can fiddle with uh, using your pen. So um, I think that a lot of the uh, sort of live programming ideas that I first saw through live coded music, it actually fits in the same sort of general scope of interacting with the entities. Um, even though it's evolved in many different forms and many different variations. Um, and I find it really interesting to see what people say and write about the live coded music um, and sort of wonder what's, what's the implications for software here in a more general sense. So uh, what's interesting about music is that in musical genres that are not notated so closely, there are no wrong notes only notes that are more or less appropriate to the performance. Um, so you can, you can play, um, you have a variety of things that make sense. Um, you can play something utterly horrible, and maybe you will hear that and recognize this is not what I wanted, but maybe you'll say, well, actually, now I'm, now I'm doing punk music, so that's fine. <laughs> and, this is sort of imported into the live coding world, where in live coders, um, or uh, to quote, live coders may, may well prefer to accept results of an imperfect execution, and they might compensate for the unexpected result by manual intervention, or even accept it as a serendipitous alternative to the original plan. So as you're live coding, if you do something that doesn't look, look right, you can do a manual intervention and correct it, do something about it, um, or you can just accept it. And um, I think that to, to sort of wrap up, I'm sure everyone's hungry, um, I think what, what I found really interesting about this, uh, this sort of process of writing the, the paper was that I really started by trying to figure out what are errors. And what I ended up with is more sort of questions about what are actually programs. Um, because the, the perspective through errors gives you a, a really sort of different way of looking at what programs are. Um, and it sort of extends further than from what I was talking about here. Uh, there's a well-known example recently where Google Translate started uh, translating, if you were translating from uh, Ukrainian to Russian, so from Russian to Ukrainian, it would translate uh, Sergei Lavrov as said little horse and Russia as Mordor. And uh, the reason why this happened is that it was trained on the uses of words in online discussions and after the <laughs> Russian invasion, Ukrainians just started referring to Lavrov as said little horse. Um, so did the program work correctly? Well, the news pages thought that it didn't. I think uh, Sergei Lavrov thought that it didn't. 
But in some sense, in the, in the very formal sense, it did work correctly. Um, so I think there's sort of a bigger question where you see, where, where if you see the programs not just as a technical art, artifact, but as a societal technological entities that exist within some context, um, then we might need to extend this idea of program to also include the data that it uses for training and machine learning. Um, I think the other interesting uh, aspect of this, of this way of thinking is to realize that people will really think about errors in, a, in a dramatically different ways or about solutions to errors. So this is another case where um, Knight Capital lost $400 million uh, because of the computer bug. Um, and what they did essentially is that they had some trading systems, um, they had some flags somewhere and that, that wasn't used, and they repurposed the flag to mean something different, deployed a new version of the software, turned on the flag, and on three of the four servers where they deployed the new version and started doing the new thing, on the last one server where um, they accidentally forgot to, to install the new version. It was doing what the flag was supposed to be doing years ago and sold stocks and uh, ruined the company. And if you, if you laugh, if you'll ask my four characters from the top what was, what was the answer, the life coder will tell you how is it possible that it took them 45 minutes to shut down the machine. If they were watching it, if they, if they hear the, the wrong note, they would just shut it down in one or two minutes and they would lose some small number of millions, they would be fine. Um, the airline people will tell you, well, you added a new flag, new message, so obviously that one server should crash, maybe restart itself, crash again, restart itself, crash again, and then you would see it in, in your logs and you will realize you're now running on three of the four servers, which is still perfectly fine. Um, the, the logician will tell you, well, I can't imagine you haven't proved your system correct because you're working with money and uh, maybe you don't want to prove everything is correct. If you're playing in a club, okay, but if you're building a critical system, you must have formal verification methods and the craftsman will probably wonder what kind of test should we add, how can we address this error in the future. So, um, as the last slide, I'm going to jump here, and I think, um, well, I'll, I'll encourage you again to read the, read the paper, because I think my talk was quite representative of everything that's there, but I think there are three main important points, and I think errors teach us quite a lot. They teach us a lot about the, the history of our industry and tracing those different communities is something I found um, very, very interesting. They also teach us about paradigms and this, this idea that sort of different communities have different basic principles that they follow and um, as a result they end up asking different questions um, and not just giving different answers. And I think errors can also teach us a lot about writing programs um, and one of, the, one of the ideas that you'll find in the paper is this sort of discussion about specification where if you're in the formal world, you say, well, you have to write a precise formal specification, you have to write your theorems. Um, and in, in practice, um, this works really nicely if there are nice theorems to write, but very often the most economical description of what your program is doing isn't the theorem, but it's actually the code for the program. So, uh, have a look at errors. It's a, it's a fun topic, and thank you very much for coming.
I hope I offended everyone equally. <laughs> so speaking of errors, you, you've shown a picture of uh, the ABA programmers and it's very easy to say, you know, yeah, these stupid people who programmed ABA, they, uh, uh, they were connecting boards and everything. One of the persons in, uh, uh, on the picture was Adel Goldstein, who actually through programming ABI boards and connecting uh, these things, came up with the idea of utilizing the extra memory to store the procedures and then uh, form the program in terms of calls to those procedures and then she hired an external expert called John von Neumann and under her supervision uh, he d uh, came up with the notion of an instruction set which uh, later you know uh, <coughs> and uh, the second, she also invented language documentation uh, and later when you quoted um, Algo, uh, well, Algo quotes, and he said that it's a uh, remarkable achievement. That quote refers to a very particular in, uh, incarnation of Algo, namely Algo 68, which was said to be a, a remarkable achievement and an improvement of, on all of its predecessors, as well as the, uh, you know, all, all the things that came after that. Which was true, and the, the problem was that it you know, didn't explain the things correctly. But linking it to Dijkstra's view uh, of you know you should prove the uh, problems correct uh, is not historically correct. He was uh, one of the biggest uh, opponents of uh, that language and had very strong opinions, which are expressed in the minority. So far for the errors. Right. So um, I think. I'm not sure if I'll trace your uh, your uh, question correctly. Is I think question, not, these are two fixes. Uh, it was supposed to be a question. Uh, <laughs> no, I think I think that the, what I was saying about ENIAC wasn't in in the wasn't at all trying to imply that it was a, it was easy. I was actually trying to say that I'm impressed by the fact that anyone at all was able to write anything for ENIAC. So I have. Huge respect for for um, pro programmers of the ENIAC, and I mean the not the sort of programmers with the plan, but the actual programmers, the, the women in the picture. Um, and um, I used it as a as a sort of to, to illustrate how some people thought that uh, programming was easy, while in fact it was, it was enormously hard, and it required. Um, huge amount of ingenuity to figure out how to do it. Um, and yes, as, as, for the, as for the sort of discussion about Algol, um, if you can send me the sort of concrete references, then I would be very happy to have a look and, uh, and uh, uh, present it in a, in a more correct way. Uh, I think the overall sort of picture that Algol gives is that it's the sort of starting point for the use of formal methods, and then within that, within that general theme, there's definitely many in different. 68, and there was very interesting uh, thing with uh, two trends and uh, algol x and algol y, and uh, them, them uh, you know, competing. And uh, this is a very important step in uh, programming languages and programming. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so there's one more question over here. Just to provide a correction, Tony's point was that algol 60 was an improvement on. All its successes, and he meant Alvin 68 by that. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. Famously, uh, he, he was, uh, in terms of, he was an open minority, of course, he was a 